going to be presenting today, today is Equinox Gold. Uh, Equinox has a portfolio of assets uh, in Brazil, Mexico, uh, the US, and they're now uh, expanding into Canada. Um, just as a quick friendly reminder, if you do want to ask a question, you can submit those through the app and I will uh, ask them at the end. And uh, with that, uh, here to give us an update is the company CEO, Christian Malo. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, glad to be back here in person. It's, it feels like it's been a long time I'm seeing some faces. It's a little odd talking not to a screen for a change. Um, I really just want to recap on the story here at Equinox for those of you not as familiar, but also give you a really good update because there's been so much happening over the last two years since we were last here. And obviously Equinox was built um, about four years ago, actually, the concept was pulled together. Ross Beattie, who's here with us, and uh, Richard Wark, myself, Greg Smith, we sat down and we really wanted to pull together a vehicle where we could launch one of the next good size, ultimately growing into a large size gold producer. And that was in the sort of tw late 2017 period. And this is the result of that platform within a four short years. So we've now got a diversified portfolio across the Americas. You know, similar size production when they're all up and running and all the growth is factored in across the portfolio, you know, three, four hundred thousand ounces roughly per jurisdiction. Lots of upside through exploration, through development in each, almost in each of these jurisdictions. So we're really excited about the platform we're building. And when we started this, gold was about, I think it was $1,180 an ounce. I remember running one of the models at. So really changed environment. We just really felt it was the time and we needed to replace some of those companies and you know, assets that had been taken out during the last cycle. And we really wanted to put in place one of the next great Canadian gold producers. And when I look at the history, you know, we really started from a standing start in late 2017. Uh, we acquired Mesquite from New Gold for about $150 million. Um, that mine has generated, almost, I think, almost $200 million in the first two and a half, three years that we've owned it. So it's been a really good result. Um, then we added Arizona. Well, it was part of the portfolio, but we added it into production. We built that mine on time, on budget. It was just $160 million. And now it's generating $100 million a year of cash flow and lots of exploration upside, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Then we did the Leah Gold acquisition. We added uh, five mines there, uh, lots of ounces, seven million ounces. And Brazil has been fantastic. We stumbled a little bit in Mexico last year, which I'll touch on a little bit later. But otherwise, you know, the Brazilian mines have been a great addition to the portfolio. And then this, in this past year, in 2021, we added Premier Gold. And we consider ourselves a little bit fortunate to have come across that. And we think we've added one of the big, great Canadian potential gold producers here in the next few years and we're in the middle of construction at Greenstone in Ontario and that'll add almost 400,000 ounces to the profile. I mean we have 250,000 of that in terms of our pro rata percentage but that's going to be one of the biggest Canadian mines, probably number four when it's up in production. And then we're in the middle of finishing off the construction at Santa Luz. So if you look at that profile going from a standing start in late 17, early 18, all the way up to almost 700,000 ounces this year, with a runway to well over a million ounces over the next few years as we continue to develop our portfolio. So we started with a bit of an M&A focused, put together scale, diversity, liquidity, and I think we've achieved a lot of those things and now it's really about executing on this portfolio and building out the assets that we have and continuing to explore them. And just looking back a little bit, I mean, one of the key things for us is there's a lot of insider ownership in this company. I think 8.5% of it is owned by um, ourselves as management as well by the board. I think Ross owns the majority of that 8%, but all of us as management own a material stake. It's meaningful when the share price goes up and it's really painful when the share price goes down. And these are important metrics that we look at. Not every company I know looks at it, but on a per share basis, are we, trying, are we adding some value? Um, reserve and resource, resource growth per share operating cash flow per share and then production per share. And we continue to add value in that sense. We now need to translate that into market cap and share price. But with the building blocks are coming together nicely. ESG, definitely don't want to miss touching on this. And ESG is a really important part of our focus. We're a new company in a sense that we've pulled together a lot of assets from disparate companies and locations. So we're getting everything onto the same platform. But 
ESG for us is more than just sort of uh, annual reporting, sustainability reporting. It's actually something that we live with. So as we go into a project, as we develop things, or as we look at the efficiencies in all of our business, we actually look at how can we make it better, but also make it more sustainable and friendly. And just as a couple of examples, in Brazil, we're actually looking at all of our power sources, because at the moment, I think 85% of our emissions come from uh, our diesel trucks and our power for our plants. And in Brazil, it's actually the operating team that came up with this, but they came to us and said, hey, let's switch to all solar and wind power. We've had about six proposals to do that. And we'll actually have a greener source of energy to renewable, and we're going to save $10 million a year. So it's just a win-win-win across the whole platform. Uh, we're looking at all of our new projects. California, could we go to uh, solar power? We're looking at ways to save water, recycle water, improve our usage on water, because in California and a couple other locations, it's quite scarce. In parts of Brazil, it's actually a little too much water these days. But um, we're looking across our whole platform and how can we can do things better. And we're also getting a lot of data out to the market. So we've started to report our emissions and our scope one and two emissions in the last year. We set reduction targets. This year, one of the big jobs we have is setting a long-term target. We're not quite there yet. We're developing the plan. We're focusing on what emissions we are emitting, what we can control in the future. But we need to get up to speed by the end of this year and be able to give a, an indication to the market what our long-term plans are and what our interim goals will be. And diving a little bit into each of the countries or the assets individually here, just for those who are not quite as familiar, but Mesquite was the first mine that we, we acquired. It produces about 130,000 ounces of gold. Big heat bleach operation going for about 30 years. And when we bought this, it had a two and a half year mine life. We've been mining for well over two and a half years, and it still has a two to three year mine life. Um, and we continue to explore. We keep sinking dollars in, and we keep adding ounces incrementally here. Will it get to a 10-year mine life? Well, maybe not in the short term. There is a chance in the longer term as we go across the highway and we continue to explore along the trend here. But we just keep adding ounces around this property. And so we've been really pleased with it. And it's been a core part of our business in California, which allowed us to help leverage up and actually get Castle Mountain into production, which is a small scale, almost like a pilot plant at this stage. It's 30,000 ounces a year. It's a four-hour drive from uh, Mesquite. And the plan here is to expand it eventually to so it'll be a, about 16 or 18-year mine life at 200,000 ounces a year. But at the moment, what we do is we share management, we share some of the systems, the people, we actually ship the carbon down to uh, Mesquite on a truck, and we basically smelt all the gold down at the one site. So we're using the infrastructure and the proximity of these sites to be a little more efficient in one location. And we think of them as a unit. And we have one sort of general manager actually managing both of them. But in the end of the day, this could be uh, you know, 300 to 350,000 ounces of production between these two sites, so a nice core bit of our operation. In terms of Castle Mountain, in terms of that second phase, we've actually done a lot of drilling on the water, which was a key component of getting to phase two. We've actually found four locations, including the current location for our water wells, that we're actually able to access water. And there's two big aquifers in the area. And actually, the hydrogeologist said to us on the fourth one, which is about 30 miles away, it's probably one of the best wells he's seen in California in the history of his work there. So we're really pleased with what we're seeing. We think we've knocked off that risk issue for this mine. And really, the next point is submitting our amendment permit, which will actually happen in the month of March. And so we'll set the time clock going there. And in the discussions with the regulators, you know, we may be in a three-year process to update an EIS. But there are indications that we might be able to go a little bit faster if we get to just an amendment of the current uh, plan of operation and current uh, conditional use permit, which uh, might make it a two-year pro process. So at the moment, we're sort of guiding towards three years. But that kind of gets it permitted and ready to build that phase two just after Greenstone comes into production in 2024. So nice sort of core part of our business in California. Turning over to Mexico, I'll just touch on Mercedes first. We actually just announced the sale of that a few months ago. Uh, Bear Creek's buying it for about 100 million of cash, a royalty, and some shares in Bear Creek. So it's going to a good home that's looking for production. It's a bit small in our portfolio. It was just under 50,000 ounces a year. But this does have potential to go up to 60 to maybe 80,000 ounces a year with some investment, some effort, some real focus on it where we're really focused on our bigger assets, where the returns are larger. And so we're really happy to see that find a good home. We'll be a meaningful shareholder to them. We actually like what they're doing. And then we'll focus on Los Filos in Mexico. And Los Filos, it's been a challenging go in the last year and a half since we bought uh, Leo Gold. Um, it's a great deposit. It's a world-class deposit. It's got 12 or 13 million ounces in resources and reserves right now. Um, there's probably another 5 to 10 that we could add through exploration there. 
Um, at the moment, unfortunately, it's producing less than 200,000 ounces of gold. And really the plan there was to take the big heap leach operation, build a carbon and leach plant, and it'll be producing 300 to 350,000 ounces and reducing its costs. What we've decided to do, because we've had a couple of blockades, for those of you familiar with it, and happy to take questions on that at the end if, if necessary, um, we've postponed that CIL plant, so we're going to focus on building out our greenstone mine, and as we get stability with the communities, and as we get comfortable again, we told them we'll go back in there, we'll build the CIL plant, but in the interim, it'll be a big heap leach operation, uh, probably around 200,000 ounces of production, actually it might even go up to 250,000 as we bring higher grade material into the plant over the next year or so, and we open up a new underground deposit. So that one's kind of a wait and see a little bit but actually it sequences in quite nicely with our capital at the end of the day because it will probably cost 230, 40, maybe 50 million dollars to build that CIL plant. And then we go to Brazil and Brazil has been, you know, honestly since the last five years we got back into Brazil and we were starting to build Orizona. It's just been wonderful for us. Um, you know, the Arizona mine, you know, it's just been knocking it out of the park in terms of cash flow. We've doubled the mine life last year with an underground uh, deposit that we've added to the actual uh, pre-feasibility study that we put out. It produces 120, 30,000 ounces. And as we start to factor in some of that higher grade underground material, hopefully in the next two or three years here, you can maybe take that to 150, 60, 70, maybe 80,000 ounces without much change, uh, really not changing the infrastructure other than the underground uh, workings. And so that one, has a nice base, it's generating a lot of cash flow, lots of exploration upside, we've got a thousand square kilometers around this deposit and we're actually allocating a reasonable amount to exploration drilling at the moment and um, you know we'll keep putting out news periodically on this as we continue to drill, particularly in the underground. And then you look at Fazenda and that's just down the road from the Santa Luz mine which we're building at the moment. It's a small mine, it's about 60, 70,000 ounces a year. Um, it's been going for 25 years, good workmanlike underground focused mine with a bit of open pit material. And it will basically form part of our overall area and greenstone belt in, um, in Bahia State. So between that and Santa Luz there should be about 160 to 80,000 ounces of gold. So a nice core part of our business as well that balances off Arizona nicely. Um, at the end of the day, we're actually going to end up exploring a lot of that greenstone belt in between the two. We've actually gotten a lot of the exploration concessions in the last uh, year and we started to drill them. We're just waiting for some results to come in right now. Hopefully we'll have some news out this quarter on that. But so far we like what we see and actually the opportunity here is we actually can pro process material at either one of those plants depending on what type of ore it is. So there's going to be some flexibility here. And at the end of the day we kind of look at it as one complex and maybe at the end of the day we'll start reporting it as one complex as well and having more common management of the two once it's up and running at Santa Luz. So we've got the two core parts of our business there in Brazil. And then RDM is probably the, uh, the third area and it's a little bit smaller mine, it's 70 to 80,000 ounces this year but we've done some strategic planning with the team locally and they've come up with a plan actually to expand the production here up to 90 to 100,000 ounces to make it more meaningful in our portfolio. So over the next year or two we're actually stripping the current pit, we're actually looking at the underground as well at both Santa Luz and RDM and, uh, and in Arizona at the same time. We're also going to be uh, just knocking off any of the, the small little expansionary capital items that we need to do to, to grow RDM. And two of the, is the historical issues there, if you remember, it didn't have enough power and water. Well, it now has a connection to the grid that's been very reliable. Um, it actually has too much water these days. Um, actually we've had to stop it for two weeks to actually pump some water out of the TSF. And right now we're feeling really comfortable we can get that up to a meaningful part of our production base at a good cost in the next couple of years here. And turning over to the two main projects that consume our time and thinking at the moment, uh, Santa Luz, we've been building this for the past about 12, 13 months. It was a hundred million dollar refurbishment of a past producing mine. It'll produce 110,000 ounces a year at a very good cost at well below a thousand dollars an ounce. And it's only 103 million dollars and that's the nice thing about this. It's very low capital spend to get this mine up and running again. Um, we basically are ready to go here. We should be pouring gold in the second half of March. It's tracking basically on time, on budget and real kudos to the team here. This is during COVID, it's during all the supply chain issues, the escalation and that. And they've found ways to manage through that. So first mining began in June last year so we've got lots of ore stockpiled. Uh, the mills are turning now, they're actually in the middle of hot commissioning. Our head of technical services head, headed down there just to get it ramped up and help the team and we should be pouring gold in the second half of March. So that one's tracking really nicely to add, you know, 70 to 90,000 ounces this year but in following years it'll be over 100,000 ounces. 
and Greenstone. Uh, this is the big mine that we added with the Premier Gold acquisition. We acquired 50% of it by acquiring Premier and Orion at the same time bought the other 50% from Sentara. There was obviously a, a legal situation going on there and the two operators were not able to come to a plan to move this forward. So it really opened up for us once Orion came in and bought the Sentara stake. We agreed to buy another 10%, so we're now a 60% owner of this project. And um, we carry 60% of the capital. We'll have 60% of the attributable balances. There's five and a half million ounces already in this deposit. And we just love this one because Orion is a financial partner. They've given us the lead on this, so it's an Equinox branded mine. And we're able to move this forward very quickly because when we took it over, they had a team in place. They're mostly ex Nico Eagle guys who have built mines in northern Canada in very remote locations. Um, they were able to integrate G mining into the team to work on the plant and some of the engineering works. And we're, we started official construction in late October last year and the plan was to kind of be close to finishing Santa Luz, then leg into this mine and really get it going quickly before, um, you know, before the real uh, snow hit and we were able to clear trees, get roads ready to go and, and ultimately now this winter we were able to capitalize on all that uh, period where the water isn't running, we are able to clear land, we are getting the tailings dam advanced, getting the engineering done and so when we get into April, May this year we'll have most of the engineering almost complete. We're actually going to have the tailings dam well advanced and it's advancing ahead of schedule right now. We've got the plant site cleared, we're pouring concrete currently and we should be able to enclose a lot of buildings during the summer period where there'll be high level of activity on site so that next winter we're working indoors in better conditions. So um, the team's got a lot of experience in these kind of weather conditions. I think it's minus 30 there right now. And it has a 14 year mine life to start and there's a lot of potential to explore along strike and underground eventually as well. So this one again is going to be one of those cornerstone pillars of our portfolio and it'll be the fourth largest mine in Canada once it's up and running. So just love the fact that we we're able to acquire this and when you look at our premier gold acquisition, I think we paid 550 million or something for the whole company. We just sold Mercedes for almost 150 million. We spun out I-80 gold which now has a value of 150 million for our 25% stake. We own Hasaga and Red Lake which came with that which are interesting deposits there in Red Lake that haven't got any value surfaced at this stage but if you add up all the numbers and you look at what we paid for it, we're going to have acquired this 60% stake in this mine for sub 200 million dollars and I think our goal is to actually end up paying zero for it when we actually surface all the value. So I think this is going to be an incredible important cornerstone piece of our portfolio for many years to come and one of the questions we get today is, you know, is that capital estimate reasonable? Um, 1.23 billion dollars, 60 percent will be what we'll be funding. Um, there's a big contingency in there, it's 14 percent, 177 million dollars. We had the opportunity obviously to watch the other Ontario projects would have really struggled over the last few years. We were able to watch the whole COVID impact, look at the escalation inf inflation, get updated steel quotes from our suppliers. We were able to factor that in. So the capital went up 20 percent from the feasibility study but we feel we have a really healthy contingency in there now. We've almost knocked off the engineering work which is one of the key problems with a lot of projects that start before they're really ready to get going. And we also have a few opportunities here to actually lease equipment to reduce the capital burden. We haven't included any pre-production revenue at this stage. We're trying to be conservative on that front. And we've also factored in more current FX rates. So we think we're in a really good starting place with a great team and so far we're on track, on budget and I think this summer is going to be a critical period where I think we'll want to get people up towards the end of summer or early fall, come up and see what's happening up there because I think it's going to be a very impressive site. The scale of it's incredible and the advancement so far has been really good. So it's a two year construction period. We'll be done uh, with commissioning after about a six month period. So in the first half of 2024 we should have this mine up and running. And then just stepping back and looking at the overall story here. So we have about six, you know, almost 700,000 ounces of annual production currently. We have a similar rate ideally for next year. And then as Greenstone comes in, you start ramping up towards that million ounce mark. And where's that growth going to come from? And it's almost sequenced nicely here from left to right. So Santa Luz in 2020, uh, in 2023 will add another 30,000 ounces on top of what it will do this year. Greenstone will add 240,000 ounces when it's up and running. Philos has a multi-phased approach because we're opening up the new deposit to add the 50,000 ounces a year from Burma Hall. And then the new CIL plant will add another 75,000 ounces on top of that. And once we're actually done with Greenstone, we have the ability and flexibility in terms of cash flow on that to also get going on Castle Mountain once that permitting amendment's done. And that'll add another 180,000 ounces. And then Arizona, there's underground expansion potential. So we've got almost 600,000 ounces of 
funded internal growth, so we don't need to acquire any further production growth to get us towards 1.2 million ounces a year of production. And at this point in time, where are we trading in the market? And that's the right-hand side of this graph, which is, you know, the intermediate producers and senior producers are trading between 0.75 and 1 times, kind of a depressed level compared to historical multiples. Uh, we're currently trading more like a developer at 0.63. I think now that 2021 is done, I think the Philos, Los Filos situation is hopefully behind us. We've had stability for a period here now. Um, I think most of the value of that's been knocked out of our stock price, so I think there's only upside to come from that in due course. And then you look at basically de-risking Greenstone and Santa Luz, and as we continue to do that, that multiple will climb naturally towards its peers and that sort of intermediate to sort of smaller seniors level. Even without the gold price change, we think we've got a really exciting next to a year and a half or so as we climb and claw our way back up that multiple scale. And how does the balance sheet look? And that is a question we get on occasion here, but the best thing about this slide is it almost hasn't changed in a year. We still got $500 million of liquidity, cash, and a revolver available. We still got almost half a billion dollars in investments, which is $300 million of Solaris which is $150 million of I-80, which is going to be a stake in Bear Creek Mining, a stake in um, a couple other small investment or disposals that we made previously. We own a royalty portfolio, which isn't included in here. We also own a couple of assets in Red Lake, and we've got cash flow coming from our operating mines of three to $400 million, depending on your gold price. So we've got kind of almost a billion dollars in liquidity. We've got a cash flowing 700,000 ounce producing machine behind it. And we're really well placed to continue to execute on all this growth and capital uh, spend that we have over the next couple of years, with this year being probably the heaviest of the years. And just stepping back in summary here, um, we've now got seven producing mines, going to eight very soon. We've got five growth projects internally. We've got a massive reserve and resource base of 16 and 30 million ounces. Um, we've got a great balance sheet, and we've got a pathway to a million ounces that is well funded here. So I think our growth profile is almost unparalleled in this space and this sector right now and it's all funded internally. We don't need to go out and pay premiums and buy assets right now. We were buying them when gold was $1,100, $1,200, $1,300, $1,500 an ounce. And so we're really happy with what we've got. We like our ge geographical diversification. And I think, uh, I think this is a space to watch as we just continue to move towards that million ounce mark. And I think that value re-rate re will just come along with it over time here as we execute. And maybe, I think I've got five minutes here, Ryan, so if you have any questions. Thanks for that, Christian. And I see there actually is a question that has come through the app, so we'll start with that and feel free to add as I'm up here. But the first question that came through is, is the current joint venture structure in Greenstone expected to continue on to operation? Yeah, I mean, the joint venture structure is there to continue on up until whatever point in the indefinite future. Once it's in operations, it still continues on as normal. We'll be the lead operating partner. Orion will own its 40%. They are a financial partner, so I guess at some point there's, a, there's an opportunity for them to exit, and we'll be probably the first choice buyer of that other 40%. And we love 60% of that asset, so we probably love 100%, but at, a, at the right price, of course. Yep. Yeah, so, so they did do um, a feasibility study on Greenstone, I guess it was in 2019 and it was issued in 2020. The after-tax NPV off the top of my head, I think it was around a billion dollars if I can remember correctly. Maybe just over a billion. That was at $1,400 gold too. So it's a very different environment today for sure. We need to increase the capital a bit, but definitely look at the gold price as well. Uh, maybe I'll just ask one. Um, so you, you talked a little bit about the sequencing of the, the different growth projects that you have. Obviously, you know, Santa Luz is almost done here. Greenstone is, you know, as you said, 2024 is where you're aiming for. And then you've got kind of a few different ones. So you've got uh, Castle expansion. You've got uh, potentially, you know, Los Filos, but you talked about um, looking for stability there. So, you know, when you're thinking about competition between Filos and Castle, how do, how do we think about that? Uh, what are you looking for in terms of stability? How should we be thinking about it? 
Yeah, I mean, that will be the, the trickiest point because obviously Santa Luz, Greenstone, and probably Castle sequence just naturally very nicely. And so I think Los Filos will just look at strategically here. I think it's the stability for us is the most important issue. And I think after Greenstone's up and running, we have the flexibility as well. We could build two at the same time or there could be some overlap. And I think we're proving that right now when we're building Greenstone and we're just finishing off Santa Luz. But I see both of them coming in most likely after Greenstone. And I think the Filos one's got a little more flexibility. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe another one from me here. So you've done you know quite a few deals over the past call it three four years. You've bought some assets. Uh, you've sold some assets. You're in the process of selling uh, Mercedes. Uh, how do you feel about the portfolio now? Are you happy with where it's at? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and we were talking earlier, I think Ross and I with one of our investors and you know, we've just done a meeting with our board where we actually presented kind of where we've been and our strategic plans going forward and actually we're quite happy with where we're sitting right now. Um, all the assets we have, we feel there's upside through exploration, through expansion and that to actually make them more profitable, lower costs, et cetera, and grow the reserve base. Um, I think there's a few small non-core assets, but they're not our producing mines at this stage. It'd be things like royalty portfolio or possibly our Red Lake assets, you know, because they're very early stage. Um, and obviously, you know, owning a copper company or part of a copper company long term is probably not core. And, and you said you were talking about Los Angeles. What do you have to do to make the residents of Los Angeles happy? Yeah, so the question there was about Los Filos and how to make the, the residents happy. I mean, you know, it's a process of building back that trust. Um, you know, the real pushback they had originally is we were investing in certain areas. They happened to be on various grounds that the various different communities own. They want as much of the jobs and the economics contracts and that as possible of those, but at the detriment to other communities and really the company. So really it's a negotiating process to put in place something that keeps stability there that's fair for everyone that's involved. And I think we've hopefully done that at this stage. You know, I can't give anyone a guarantee right now, but every quarter we go on, we build stability and trust. We've replaced some of the management with actually people who are long hands and experienced in Mexico. We said no to anything that was extortion, extortion related, you know, paying fees for people to blockade our mine and that after they leave, you know, that's kind of stuff we're not going to do. Even if past past mining groups had done that kind of thing. So I think partly it's drawing the line in the sand, having some principles but also being flexible in areas that we can be where it's good for the communities. And hopefully we've actually established that at this stage. And, you know, we've certainly seen a more positive attitude and, and impression from the communities and the workforce going forward already. So we're on the right track and I think, it, you know, give it a year or so, hopefully. Maybe I'll just ask one more uh, and it's on exploration. Can you just talk uh, a little bit about uh, your exploration plans for 2022 and um, maybe I'll ask you to sort of pick your favorite child and, and okay. talk about where you maybe see the most, uh, you know, potential. Uh, that's really hard. I mean, what we are focusing on though is the mines that have less than a 10 year mine life particularly. So that whole sort of Fazenda, Santa Luz belt, probably our favorite place right now. Also, Arizona Underground, we're putting another sort of, I think, seven, eight million dollars there, we're putting 10 in Santa Luz to Facenda. I think we're putting another five or six into Mesquite. So the mines that need a little bit more uh, mine life extension, that's really where we're focusing. But if you ask me about excitement, I mean, Philos is just yeah. outstanding as well. But right now, there's no need to explore there. Well, that's great. I'm uh, seeing flashing yellow signs that we have to wrap up. So I think we will uh, park it there. But thank you very much, Christian. Great. Thank you.